Welcome to the Delaware OBGYN Resident Lecture Series, where we will review the ACOG Committee Opinion 723 for October 2017, entitled Guidelines for Diagnostic Imaging in Pregnancy and Lactation. You're probably thinking this has got to be the most boring committee opinion ever. Well, if it's not, it's close. The selfless physicians who wrote this probably thought, why do we have to write the one that nobody's going to read? Well, it turns out that the stuff in here is important and comes up very frequently in day-to-day -day practice, and you interns will probably be asked something on this topic in the next week, and you former residents about to take the boards probably know this stuff, but would love the peace of mind that you are up to date on this topic as of October 2017. All right, let's go. First, let's get ultrasound out of the way. There are no proven harmful effects to the fetus for diagnostic ultrasound, including duplex Doppler and color Doppler. Imaging units are to keep acoustic levels as low as reasonably achievable. That's the ALARA principle. So ultrasound is safe. Next, MRI. A large retrospective study in JAMA 2016 looked at the safety of MRI and the safety of MRI with gadolinium. Bottom line, MRI safe regarding stillbirth, neoplasm, teratogenesis, and the effects on vision and hearing. Now let's talk gadolinium. It's a metal used in a chelated or bound form, and it shortens the T1 relaxation time, whatever that means. That increases the differences in tissues and increases the contrast and the appearance of these tissues, improving the image. It is particularly good at increasing the contrast between blood in vessels and surrounding tissue, making it great for MR angiography. However, that same large study found an increase in rheumatologic, inflammatory, and infiltrative skin conditions, as well as an increase in stillbirth and neonatal death. Now, the study has some limitations, namely that the control group was those not getting an MRI, not those getting an MRI without gadolinium. Also, those skin conditions were pretty rare. Still, the default is no gadolinium in pregnancy. Any use of it is after discussion with a radiologist and the patient if the risks are thought to outweigh the benefits. As far as breastfeeding, it's water soluble. So less than 0.1% of the gadolinium dose gets into breast milk and less than 1% of that gets absorbed by the infant's GI tract. So don't interrupt breastfeeding if the mom got gadolinium. On to ionizing radiation or x-ray. For our purposes, the measure of the amount of energy deposited per kilogram of tissue is used. The unit you will see in current recommendations is the milligray. One gray equals 100 rads. One milligray equals 0.1 rads. The effect on the fetus depends on when and how much. Here's the chart in the committee opinion. The chart uses gestational age with respect to fertilization, but I find it more useful to think in terms of menstrual weeks. The all or none period is up to four menstrual weeks, or about the time of the missed period. So a pregnancy exposed during this time that continues is probably fine. Four to ten weeks is organogenesis, or the embryonic period. Doses over 200 milligrays increase the risk of anomalies, or IUGR. After the embryonic period comes the fetal period starting at 10 weeks. Neuronal migration is occurring and is susceptible. Information for this comes from nuclear bomb survivors and the thresholds are probably much higher. Just keep in mind, nothing bad in terms of loss, anomalies, IUGR, or intellectual abilities has been proven for doses less than 50 milligray. Here is the chart of doses with typical diagnostic testing. Go ahead and pause here, take a screenshot, and save that. Fortunately, the most common ones, like a chest x-ray to rule out pneumonia or pulmonary edema, or a C-spine and limb x-rays for motor vehicle accidents, are very low in terms of fetal dose. But you can see that CTs and nuclear medicine studies start to get a little more. The highest exposures are going to be with imaging that the fetus can't be completely shielded. These are often used when either the pregnancy is not known yet, or the risks of not performing the test has a high risk to the mother and therefore the fetus because of its dependence on the mother. In general, MRI is preferred over CT if it is accessible. 
On the other hand, a spiral CT of the chest to rule out a pulmonary embolism has less fetal exposure than a VQ scan. CT contrast agents are generally fine. Oral agents are not absorbed, and IV agents are generally iodinated and safe in pregnancy. But the default is not to use them. There is no reason to stop breastfeeding, just like with gadolinium. For nuclear medicine scans, avoid radioactive iodine. It gets concentrated in the fetal thyroid and can ablate it. Technetiums should be used if necessary. Its use in a VQ scan involves less than 5 milligray and is considered safe. The committee opinion doesn't specifically address how to counsel patients, but provides this information for you to use. Everything we do involves a risk-benefit analysis, and a lot of them probably should involve discussing it with the patient. We don't discuss the risks and benefits of a cervical exam in labor or prescribing a Tylenol for a headache and maybe the need for an ultrasound or an MRI. But keep in mind the background risk of congenital malformations, about 3 to 4 percent, and of childhood malignancies, 1 in 285 before the age of 20. They are going to happen to children you've delivered, and the parents will probably look back and analyze the pregnancy in great detail. Having had the discussion in advance will be very useful, since the vast majority of time the exposure was not enough to be implicated, giving them reassurance that they and you had proceeded in a reasonable manner. Your counseling and documentation can include, one, the background risk of malignancy and defects, two, at what level does the radiation increase these risks, three, what dose their baby is going to get, four, the risk of not getting the test or why you're getting the test. Here's an example. 32-weeker comes in with asthma, shortness of breath, and a fever, and you would like to get a chest x-ray. You might say, we would like to get a chest x-ray to see if you have pneumonia. Patients are often concerned about the safety of x-ray in pregnancy, particularly birth defects and childhood malignancy. The risk of any child getting those is about 3 to 4 percent for defects and a third of a percent for malignancy. One is pretty rare and the other is not so rare. Fortunately, the radiation of a chest x-ray is about 0.01 at the most and it's not until about a thousand times that dose that the risk of malignancy increases and about 5,000 times that for birth defects. Knowing whether you have pneumonia can affect whether we admit you, how we give you antibiotics, and figuring out whether we need to do more testing. Undertreating can result in serious illness and affect the pregnancy, and overtreating has its consequences as well. So we think you should get the x-ray. For a chest CT to rule out PE, you would change the exposure to 0.66, which is the upper end of the range, and say that it is still well below the 10 to 20 milligray for malignancy and 50 milligray for intellectual or structural defects. And actually, the thresholds are probably even higher than 200. For most imaging, this will get you in the ballpark. For special circumstances, like a patient having received large doses of diagnostic radiation while being treated for trauma or malignancy, consult your hospital's radiation physicist for a formal consult. If you're wondering what's different about this committee opinion as compared to the one it replaced, this one is primarily updating information about gadolinium use with MRI. Essentially, MRI is safe in pregnancy. Gadolinium should be avoided because of the increased risk in rheumatologic inflammatory and infiltrative skin conditions and stillbirths and neonatal deaths. These are findings that were increased in the gadolinium group.